Hey everyone, this is Three Questions with Eric Barker. Told you, music and everything, man. <laughs> Told you. So I'm really excited because uh, I've actually been following Eric Barker. And I'm saying your, I'm assuming I'm saying your name right. I don't know. Is it, maybe it's like if it's French or Barker. I don't know. Like, <laughs> no, Barker's correct. Yeah. So I've been following you forever. Um, and uh, I, I got your new book here. And uh, you can see it here. Plays plays well with others. The surprising science behind why everything you know about relationships is mostly wrong. And uh, I, I, I've just loved your writing forever. It's been something that's really inspiring to me. Uh, it's something I try to emulate, to be honest with you. I told you about um, yeah. before we were talking, Rick Riley, you have, uh, you take really boring concepts and you make them funny, like, and you talk about <laughs> science, right? So like, kind of like what even inspired you to start kind of writing that way? Is it just your personality? Like, like, how do you take these concepts and actually make them really enjoyable to read? Uh, I mean, it's, it's funny because before I ever started writing books, before I started my blog, uh, I was a screenwriter in Hollywood for 10 years oh, wow. and I, I wrote very commercial stuff. I wrote action movies and then animated movies. So, I mean, wow. you know, part of it's my personality, but part of it's kind of, I spent a lot of time training, you know, it's like basically how, how to, you know, it's like people can't get bored. Like that's my, that's my kind of rule is people can't get bored. And not only that, like movies, you know, books can be 600 pages. Movies happen in real time. So, you know, you cannot lose the audience's attention. And, you know, my style is to just kind of, you know, crack jokes, make fun of things, be accessible, be human. And it was very funny because, you know, when I first started the blog, I was just putting like, like study abstracts on there. And then I just started bringing out the writing voice, bringing out, you know, like, kind of like my screenwriting background and you know the the style kind of works i think people people like it when there's some sugar to make the medicine go down totally it was well, and i was just thinking about this because like you know your your ability to write you know in a time of like tiktok and things yeah. like that like I, i'm gonna be honest with you it's hard to keep my attention right and i <laughs> I, I write books and i'm sitting here i'm like i'm like how is he doing this like i'm actually interested in the stuff that he's talking about but you just do it in a way that like it, it, it it's interesting because um, you know, you're, you're learning a ton of stuff, but you don't, <laughs> I know it's horrible. You don't even realize it, right? Like, it's kind of, kind of fascinating, uh, like how you do that. And I, I think, you know, uh, you know, when we talked before, I'm very involved, obviously in education yeah. and I think about that, that connection, you know, um, you know, when I was teaching in my classroom, you know, the way I, I do my speaking events, I, I try to mesh a lot of humor and like personal, like narrative yeah. in there to actually like bring points home. I think that story, you know, really connects. And so like what what inspired you to write um, this book in the first place? I mean, uh, relationships have never been my strong suit. You know, I've always been you more. Said that. You said that actually. Yeah. I was like, kind of shocked when you said that in the book. Yeah, it's it's not my strong suit. Pretty introverted on the on the big five personality traits. One is agreeableness. And I, I scored a four <laughs> out of 100. So uh, great, great for being the kind of like right. rigorous, right. like testing theories, kind of tough, skeptical, but uh, no, relationships are never my strong suit. And, you know, my first book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, was all testing the maxims about success, like mm -hmm. do nice guys finish last? And so I took the same structure and I said, let's apply this to relationships. Let's te test those maxims, like does love conquer all? Is a friend in need a friend indeed? Mm -hmm. And so what was really crazy was, you know, I, I was putting the proposal together, closed the book deal, and literally two weeks after I closed the book deal, um, California, where I live, locked down for the pandemic. And so what? I went from- When was that? <laughs> so I, I I don't think I caused it, I promise. But <laughs> I I like went from, oh, hey, people will find this useful. It's about relationships and you right. know I'm fine against you to all of a sudden, oh my God, like it took on a higher purpose. Like I was right. like, this, people are going to need this. I'm going to need this. It's like, this is all of a sudden became much more relevant knowledge. So I, I kind of like cue the Rocky theme. I was like, you know, I was a man on a mission and I, I kind of had this like new drive to kind of get this right. Would you actually say like you're, so it's kind of, it's interesting because like I, I try to explain to people that I'm an, it's actually a term uh, ambivert, right? Yeah. I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with that, right? Like, yeah. like in the, the notion is that, people see me i'm pretty you know easy going friendly and stuff like that but i when i do connect with people it sucks the life out of me right like yeah. it's, it's not it's not that i can't interact 
Yeah. So like, is that kind of, is, are you, would you say you're kind of like that similar vein? Cause like, obviously you're very, or are you just like kind of like funny on, you know, Twitter and your blog and then, you know, in person, like wouldn't want to be around you. Is that kind of how it I, I mean, no, it's just more like, it's, it's more just, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine with, you know, with, yeah, yeah. with people just, I, I kind of draw my energy from but all of my friends when the pandemic first happened, all of my friends, different people who didn't know each other were texting me being like, you know, you are the person we know most likely to be completely unaffected by lockdown. You know, this, this is, this is like threatening, you're, you're threatening a fish by saying, I'm going to throw you into water. You know, like it's, it's not. So, I, I mean, I'm perfectly fine with people. It's just like, I, you know, I am pretty good, like on my own and like, and frankly for writing books, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, yeah. it, it kind of helps. And, but the other thing is, you know, if you're not naturally inclined that way, you know, that's why I said, like, I need this book because I, I am not actually inclined that way. You just don't get the practice. You know, if you're not spending the time, if you're not, you know, you you miss a lot of stuff. Social cues. I think a lot of us are probably experiencing that to some degree or another because we've just been out of it for so long. Yeah, it's it's funny because like I I you know obviously I write myself. We talked about this before, and uh, it's weird because I like. I like the isolation. I have the big headphones and stuff like that. And I'll yeah. go into Starbucks because I like to people watch, but I put on the big headphones. It's like, Hey, I, li I'm, I like watching what's going on, but don't talk to me. That, like, that's, that's your signal. That's your, your throat. You're throwing yeah. up your gang signs. As like, as, no, as not as here. As, head, as soon as the headphones come up, you're right. It's the same thing in the airplane. I like, it's actually just telling the story about how like I was on an airplane and I just kind of noticed the person kind of like, just like looking, <laughs> over and I'm like, no, looking at you out of the corner of the like, eye. Yeah. No, no, no. This is happening, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I'm down. I'm, you know, I'm down in this this space, right? Hey, so I did want to ask you a couple. I, I read your book, and like I said, it's called Play Well with Others. I, I highly suggested it. it's actually in the description uh, down below. And uh, I, I there's like a couple of parts I want to highlight that you, you said. Of, there's one part that you talked about on can you judge a book by its cover, and you you said this. Instead of focusing on not judging a book by its cover, it'd be more useful to say we'd be better off putting more effort into revisiting the judgments we will undoubtedly make. And I, I just love that statement. So can you kind of expand on that, what you mean by that? Yeah, because the, the thing is that we we can't help but judge a book by its cover. Right. You know, like basically as soon as we, you know, when we're meeting somebody for the first time, you know, we immediately start making ju you know judgments about them. And the shocking thing is first impressions with strangers uh, are shockingly like pretty accurate, usually right. about like at the 70 percent level. There's a lot of research on thin slicing that if you were to and actually it was done on educators uh, that if, if you show people a video with no sound of a teacher in a classroom for show the video for just a few minutes, uh, people's ability to predict, predict, is this person competent at their job is mm. surprisingly high at like the 70 plus percent level. And so we immediately size people up in terms of their personality, right. you know, how friendly are they, how conscientious it happens. So to say, well, I'm not going to, it's impossible, you mm. know, so we are much smarter to kind of, like I said, 70% is pretty good, but 70% is also a D. Yeah. So we, we, we need to kind of take those first impressions, realize that they're hypotheses, and mm -hmm. then kind of test them before we just assume this is a good person or a bad person. Right. And, and it's funny because, like, I, I've had people say to me before, like, hey, like, they'll say, say something like, don't judge me. I'm like, oh, I'm totally judging you. And <laughs> we, you, you mean don't judge you harshly is what you mean. <laughs> I mean, right? don't, don't, always, don't let want, you know I'm judging you. Okay. Right. We, I, we, we want, we want, like, we always make judgments on people like all the time. Just sometimes, you know, what we really should be saying is, Hey, judge me in a positive manner. That's what we're asking for. Right. It's not like, don't judge me. It's actually yeah. don't judge me negatively is what we're saying. So I, I, I think that is uh, uh really profound when I, when I was thinking about this book, one of the questions I've really struggled with um, as an educator, as a former principal yeah. is, the idea that like we i had a there was a principal i worked with his name is david pesek and he said something really powerful he said a teacher that is good with relationships and bad with curriculum could actually last a lot longer than one who's the opposite right that they actually can connect yeah. with students and things like that yeah. like if you're really you know you know your stuff really well but you're you don't actually build relationships well um and so one of the questions i get all the time is like how do you help 
uh, like an educator who struggles building relationships. And to be honest, with you, a lot of times I, I don't know the answer. And so yeah. like, is that something you can actually develop? Is that something you believe people can actually, and you kind of mentioned this in yourself, is that something people can actually work on where they become good at relationships and how they connect with other people, whether there's their colleagues, whether students in the classroom, is that something you can learn? Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, similar to what you're saying about uh, with educators, uh, you know, therapy, you know, there's many different modalities, uh, you know, CBT, DBT, like all kinds mm -hmm. of, and some of them are more effective than others. But what the research shows is that the people's relationship, their connection to their therapist is yeah. actually more indicative of whether they'll recover than the actual, like, wow. you know, it's like, be funny to think if, <clears throat> you know, if, if that was true for medical science, you know, it's like, oh, the, the surgery doesn't matter. But if your doctor's friendly, you know, your the cancer will go away. Right. You know, it's like, but this is really true. And I, and I think what's, you know, critical there can be critical, you know, for educators is, you know, is, is, you know, opening up a little bit. I mean, I think there's issues where certainly, you know, in many educational situations, there needs to be a level of authority, you know, but being friendly, being accessible, right. you know, it's like that. And part of that opening up, it's sort of, I talk about that in the friendship section of the book. It's one of the two key elements of deepening friendships. One is time and time you'll get plenty of as, as an educator, yeah. but, uh, but like issue of vulnerability of opening up a little bit, just seeming human. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember being a kid and just thinking that my teachers were another species, you know, like <laughs> right. they, they just weren't, they weren't like me or, or they were, they were prison guards, um, right. you know, versus we've all had kind of the cool teacher who seemed like a person, you right. know, and that issue of being it. Now, you don't want anything that questions your capacity to do your job. You don't want to admit vulnerabilities yeah. around your ability to educate your knowledge. But, you know, basically opening up a little bit, seeming having the same emotions that people do. This is really critical because, you know, vulnerability is is so powerful in the sense that uh, Jeff Hall's done a lot of research on how long it takes to establish a bond with people and getting mm -hmm. to a friendship, a, 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 a best friend takes literally dozens or hundreds of hours. But yet Arthur Aaron, who does research at Stony Brook University, he was able to make two people feel like lifelong friends in 45 minutes. Oh, and wow. how he how he did it was by, you know, having them exchange answers to questions that were a little more personal you know, opening up a little bit, understanding where this person's coming from. And we're often a little bit afraid of this. In the book, I talk about the scary rule, where if it's scary, yeah. say it. Now, you don't have to confess to any murders yeah. at Christmas dinner. Yeah. Don't, don't. <laughs> but opening up a little bit and seeming human and yeah. having more aspects, more facets of the diamond that any person could potentially relate to, if you don't give that information, especially emotional information, there's like nothing to grasp onto versus if you're presenting different areas of interest, different parts of your life, different emotional areas, it just gives more facets for someone to say, oh, I'm like that too. Yeah, it's actually, uh, Covey talks about the, and you kind of touched on this, the the importance of character and competence, right? So it's not yeah. like, you you know, if you have good relationships, but you don't know anything about teaching, then your kid, your students will be fine, right? <laughs> Yeah. But it's actually saying that if you, if you don't have both of those things, you can't excel. Um, one of the things that I don't know if you've ever heard of him, his name is Dr. Atul Gawande. He actually, yes, yeah. A, yeah, and he actually talks about the importance of like bedside manner and, uh, you know, actually how that actually can make a huge difference uh, in the medical field of like, you know, how you kind of interact with people. Um, what I, I this chapter really fascinated me. I maybe I took it a little bit personal, right? Because I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like a small circle guy, you know, yeah. it, you, you wrote, it is no man, uh, an island. You wrote, I re repeated studies has shown that the happiest people have in common is good relationships, hands down. And then this part, this actually part that's really stuck with me is loneliness is so bad for your health. I'm surprised insurance companies don't mandate you put this book down and go see friends. Right. Yeah. I, I thought that was a, an amazing part. Like tell, tell me more about that. Like that idea of, you know, like why those relationships you see is like something that's actually really good for your health. And like, what, what did you find in your research for this? I mean, loneliness is correlated with pretty much every negative health metric, you mm -hmm. know, you can imagine. And, you know, relationships, a lot of it comes down to our fundamental lizard brain and just feeling safe. 
you know, it's like when we feel safe, we feel connected to others. We feel others are looking out for us. We're looking out for them. When people are lonely, neuroscience studies show that their brain literally scans for threats twice as fast. You know, yeah. it's just something subconscious where, you know, humans, we're a social species. We, 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 we evolved to, to live in tribes. It's like when we feel alone, when we feel disconnected, your brain is kind of saying, if something happens, like, Backup isn't coming, you know, there's no help right. coming. And right. so that feeling of safety, that feeling of warmth, you know, and that issue of community, where one of the things they talk about in the book is like friendship makes us happier than any other relationship, yeah. you know, hands down. Sorry, spouses, you know, friends make us happier. And even within a marriage, it's the friendship aspect of the mm -hmm. marriage that is most happiness creating. But the interesting thing is that if 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 you have five friends and mm -hmm. They're, they all know each other. And I have five friends and they don't know each other. You will actually derive more happiness and support because that creates a community of sorts. Your friends yeah. can say, hey, you know, he's struggling. We should get together and help him out. My friends can't do that. They don't know each other. They're just individual wow. like hub and spoke. It's not a community. We need that support both emotionally. We, we need to know it's there. But people can do things. They can help you. And those things are so, so, so very fundamental that like the best the best example I usually draw on is as a parent, you know, in you know, in most developed countries these days, your kid has enough to eat. You know, your kid has medical care. Mm. You know, your kid's going to be fine. But that doesn't matter. As a parent, you still want to provide for your kid. Right. You still want to feed them, even though food's plentiful. You still want to look out for them, even though they're safe. That's that's true to a degree to all of our relationships. We we want to provide for those around us. We want to feel provided for. And if that's not there, you know, it basically elevates, as I talk about in the book, it, loneliness elevates stress hormones so much. It is the equivalent of being punched in the face. Yeah. And it's funny you say that about the, the community. Actually, I'm, I'm one of the rare, I, mean, I feel like I'm one of the rare people that is like my best friends were my friends I went to elementary school with today. Even that's great. Over, right. Like it's, and it's, you know, that community, there's a, a certain element of trust. We all kind of look out for each other, even though we're like all over uh, North America, it's still yeah. kind of connected. Uh, so one of the things that you kind of talked about, and this is the last question I ask you, yeah. um, when you like, what has changed in you after reading this book? Is there something that you're like, you were a certain way, maybe you thought something different, like what, what changed in you, you know, say that you're someone who's kind of struggled with this and kind of going through the book, like, is anything changed in your practice and what you do today? I mean, now be, being as introverted as I am, I, you know, deliberately and assiduously, you know, make time for my friends because yeah. as the research shows, like time is the thing that friends most argue over and time is a scarce resource. It's right. a powerful signal. You routinely spend time with somebody. That means they matter to you, you know? And so I'm much more deliberate about consistently spending time with friends. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been, uh, <laughs> bit of a distant stoic tough guy in the past and yeah. um you know it doesn't it doesn't really help you know opening up a little bit like yeah. having your friends be able to know you and understand you like that helps them help you that helps them feel safe and good around you and there's we all want to be known we we yeah. all want to be understood it's like to a big part as i talk about loneliness isn't so much about being proximate to people Loneliness is about how you feel about your relationships. And when you feel that other people understand you, when you feel you've you've we've all had those times where we say, oh, I'm going to this. And your friend goes, no, you're not. You're going to X. And, you know, and and you're like, wow, well, they know me better than I know myself. And right. and that's feels so good to be known, to be understood. That's when, you know, your relationships are deep. And I'm making a lot more efforts in that arena. That's amazing. You know, it's it's funny because uh, when you when I when you first said that when we were kind of talking before we did the yeah. podcast, I was shocked because every time uh, I read your stuff, when I was reading this book, when I read your email, and ev everything I'm talking about is linked down below. It it is actually like like a buddy talking to me <laughs> and joking around, but like we're kind of like having a serious conversation, but you know, kind of throwing some spice in there a little bit yeah. too. So I, I just I like yeah I I. Uh, I love this book, um, and I love your email. I, I love being on your email list. You, you actually, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. You post at the most random times, like, <laughs> you know, like a, 
at 2 30 a.m i don't i'm like <laughs> i'm like is it is this scheduled like what's going on here? i don't know like it's just random but yeah you just kind of come out of nowhere but every time i see your your post i'm just excited so uh everyone to check out uh the book play plays well with others the surprising science behind why everything you know about relationships is mostly wrong i this is a a great book if you are an educator uh wanting to kind of you know understand relationships better and it's something that you can you know read with colleagues but you can read at the beach which is one of my favorite types of books right yeah. it'll push your thinking but you it, it's enjoyable too so eric thanks so much for being on the podcast it was like such an honor to actually meet you it's great to be here man thank you Thanks, everyone, for listening. Have a wonderful day.